Tonight we'll be viewing a short film that's been in the works for more than a year. It's about the work we do and its impact as told through the lives of one of the many thousands of patients we take care of each year. You will also hear about more than a hundred years of pathology at the University of Michigan and you'll hear from some of our leaders about where we think the field is going. What we do as pathologists is a mystery to many who are outside our offices and laboratories. I like to think of pathologists as the air traffic controllers in medicine who ensure that patients get to their correct diagnosis. I hope that this film will bring a broader understanding of pathology and what pathologists do. Now on to our film. Hi, Ms. Smith. Hi, Dr. Bierman. Hi. Nice to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Okay. Yeah. Jill's been telling me all about you, and it looks like you've already met Mary Beth, yeah. our nurse who works with yeah. us. Very good. So it's been quite a go of it for you these last <laughs> few months, hasn't it? Yeah, but you know, I'm getting through it. So. Yeah, Dr. Baker tells me you're doing really well. You're back exercising and everything. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Taking it day by day, not mm -hmm. rushing. How you doing? Very good. Well, we got you up early this morning. I know. <laughs> I was asked to see her when she was in the intensive care unit. She had actually come into the hospital, been sick for just a week or two. Actually, I've never been in the hospital before. I've never gotten sick before. I've never even gotten injured as an athlete before. And to be in the hospital was something so, you know, different for me. I run the hurdles for Michigan. I got a full scholarship. I am from Cleveland, so we had a good track team, so my coach kind of scouted me when I was younger, like maybe freshman, sophomore year in high school. I was in competition um, away for a big track meet in, in Illinois, and I got sick, um, severe stomach pain, and I went to the emergency room the day after we arrived back, and they admitted me that night. And on examination, uh, we found that she had a lymph node uh, under her left arm. And we asked that it be biopsy. It turned out to be a type of rhabdomyosarcoma that, that young people get. So even though she was unconscious and she was bleeding from every part of her body, we made the decision to go ahead and give chemotherapy. What uh, I did was rush the case through the immunohistochemistry lab and, uh, you know, told them I needed these stains this afternoon. And I first looked at it and, and I noticed it was a small blue cell tumor in which engendered a, a differential diagnosis which required a special stains. This was a small biopsy, only a needle biopsy. A small blue cell tumor is usually a tumor that is seen in, in children and, and young adults. The pathology can be very challenging in the case of sarcoma because there's so many different subtypes of an already very rare tumor. She indicated to us that, that the tumor, there was something in, in, the, in, in the space between the first and second fingers. And that, of course, made, completed the story because we knew that the cancer didn't begin in the left armpit, it had to come from somewhere. Our task next is to remove the actual source of the cancer uh, from her hand, which we'll do uh, with a surgery in a couple of weeks. And then um, once we take it out, Dr. Lucas is our pathologist who works with us. He'll go ahead and analyze the tissue.
Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's classic uh, alveolar rhabdo. We, we were kind of remarking about how it doesn't seem to have been affected at, at all by chemo despite the, the response that she had clinically. We, we pretty much have what we need here. And, we'll, and it looks like your, your margins are negative, but we'll paint ink on that and make sure everything looks okay. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay. From the start of the medical school here, which was back in the uh, in 1850, uh, pathology was not an independent subject. There were only a handful of professors, and they were professors of physiology and pathology, or materia medica and pathology, or women's diseases, internal medicine and pathology. But it wasn't until 1888, a time when medical schools in Europe and on the East Coast recognized pathology as an independent science, that Michigan began a search for a professor to teach the subject. They found Hinnage Gibbs, a British doctor who'd published an early pathology textbook. And this was in an era when bacteriology was just coming into its own. It, this was the time of uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch in Europe, and here we had a very strong uh, microbiology or bacteriology department. And into this setting, here comes uh, Gibbs, who uh, sort of didn't believe much in, in a lot of the germ theory. Gibbs soon became the subject of ridicule. Eventually, he was sidelined from his teaching post and left the university. The real start of anatomic pathology came in 1903, when Aldred Scott Wortham, who'd studied at Michigan and in Germany, was named to head the unit. So he really uh, put the department uh, and the science of pathology on a solid footing here. Wortham convinced the university's regents to make mandatory the testing of every surgical specimen that passed through the hospital. Very quickly, it became a matter of thousands of surgical specimens a year and hundreds of autopsies. Wortham also researched and published papers. He became an authority on venereal disease, and he devised ways of diagnosing tissue sections by using a stain that was created and named for him. It's still used today. He was also one of the first to study and establish a connection between heredity and cancer. Worthen died in 1931, and he was succeeded by his assistant, Carl Weller. The major function of the Department of Pathology under Dr. Weller was the strength in anatomic pathology, and then there were these other things going on, which now we recognize as part of clinical pathology. He uh, was a stickler for the teaching and the impact this would have on students, which is a very important thing and demanded the highest quality that could be mustered then for the activities of, of anatomic pathology. In 1956, Weller was succeeded by A. James French, a young surgical pathologist trained at the University of Colorado and who'd been teaching pathology at Michigan. With millions of former World War II servicemen eligible for an education under the GI Bill, Universities and medical schools across America mushroom. University Hospital among them. Well, everything was growing. At that point, the student body was growing, the hospital was growing, outpatient services were growing, the volume of business was growing. Uh, this was an era, uh, what was happening nationwide, where NIH funding was, was becoming available, so you didn't have to go pleading with your chief to give you a few pennies, people acquired more uh, uh, stance as individual productive scholars. And I think French presided beautifully.